a little bit about my office. We're a little over a year old now, so we're brand new. We started as a pilot project of the county manager's office. And just this year, we became a permanent department, which is very exciting. We work on a variety of different environmental topics, everything from energy efficiency to addressing climate change. We work on active transportation and alternative transportation for commuters and community engagement. And this is just one of the many projects I work on. And I'm really excited to talk to you guys about it, not only because it's what I do almost every single day on top of some other cool things, but it's something I'm personally interested in. And I'm a South Bay, I'm a San Jose resident. And so I'm really excited to see this happening in the South Bay as well as in San Mateo County where I work. Uh, a brief note, you might, have been, you might have heard this be called Community Choice Aggregation or Community Choice Aggregate or CCA. This is the same thing as Community Choice Energy. We started using a different term because Community Choice Aggregation is a horrible term. Nobody knows what that means. Nobody knows what aggregation is or it's a total mouthful. We felt like this was a much easier term for people to understand because it's all about energy and it's all about electricity. So if you hear CCA or CCE, it's the same thing. Oh, I also asked, please hold your questions to the end, just write them down. I'm sure you guys will have a lot of questions because it'll be a very informed, interested group. Hopefully I answer most of the things you have, and if you have additional ones, I love to talk about this and stuff. So a little bit of background, Community Choice Energy is all over the United States, happening everywhere right now. If this is something that you're interested in, I really encourage you to go on Google News and subscribe yourself to any time there's a news article about community choice energy or community choice aggregation or community choice power, you'll be shocked to see all the places this is happening in the United States, even though you don't, well, you might not hear about it a lot. Um, New York especially, this is happening all over the state of New York right now, and so it's very exciting. Here in California, it was authorized by Assembly Bill 117 in 2002. So what is community choice energy? What is CCE? CCE allows a government or a group of local governments to pool or aggregate the electricity load of their constituents together in order to purchase energy on their behalf. A big statement, right? Pretty loaded. So let's break this down a little. Right now in Northern California, we have one energy provider, and that is Pacific Gas and Electric, or PG&E. So PG&E purchases all our energy, they transmit it and deliver it over their lines, and then they deliver it to our houses and they meter and bill us. So very simplicity, simplicity. so a three-step process, more or less. What a CCE does is take out the first step of the process. And so the Community Choice Energy Program would purchase energy on everyone's behalf, but PG&E would continue to deliver the energy, maintain the lines, and bill and meter your house. So it's really not a total um, replacement of PG&E. It is a change in your energy provider, but PG&E continues to serve you some functions. So why would we want to change who our energy provider is? So when I talk about CCE, maybe because there's a lot of C's in it already, I try to emphasize the three C's. And those are choice, community power, and clean energy. So the first is choice. CCE allows a choice in energy providers where none currently exists. So right now, none of us chose PG&E. Some of us would like the same PG, some of us would probably like to choose a different option. And this is just a different option as your energy provider. It also allows residents to choose between different energy options. So right, um, right now, you have your one electricity. You get a, don't get to choose how much renewable energy is in that electricity. But within a CCE, you did get to choose between different electricity options, each with a different renewable energy content. The second benefit is community power. One of the reasons that a CCE enhances community power is because it runs as a nonprofit, not as a company. So these surplus funds are not going to shareholders. They can be used to be reinvested back into the community. And the community gets more say in how these funds are used. So in current CCAs, or CCEs, some of the ways these funds are being reinvested are in local renewable energy projects, 
is also being used for tailored energy efficiency programs. So energy efficiency programs that are tailored to the communities they serve so they can be more effective. Or it's being used for really cool, innovative energy efficiency options. And there's a whole slew of possibilities that these funds can be used for. The third benefit, and the one I'm sure you guys as environmentalists are probably most interested in, and is that really appealing to cities right now, is clean energy. Because as I said, CCEs, specifically in California, this is unique to California, not all CCEs in the United States are doing this, but in California they're offering more renewable energy than the incumbent utilities at a lower or same rate. Meaning that people are getting more renewable energy, but they're getting it for less money. And that's really exciting, because why are we already getting this if this is a possibility? A lot of cities and environmental groups and community groups are excited about this because it's a really big way to reduce our greenhouse gas footprint from energy production. So as we know, a lot of cities have climate action, or counties too, have climate action plan goals that we have to meet. And so this is just a really good visual example of the town of Anselmo. It's in Berwyn County, so it's currently served by a CCA right now. And they wrote in their climate action plan before they, they joined the CCA, they looked at all these different options they could do to reduce their greenhouse gas footprint. And as you can see, CCA or CCE was by far the single biggest action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce their, at the bottom is tons of um, carbon dioxide reduced. As you can see, even multiple of those measures added up together could not meet what Community Choice Energy could do. This is just a more general policy framework when we talk about reducing greenhouse gas emissions and energy. There's a lot of factors um, going into this. On top of the bill that allowed for Community Choice Energy, we also have AB32, the Global Warming Bill. We have the California Portfolio Standard, which requires all electricity providers to have a certain percentage of renewable energy content, and it's the energy content goes up over time. So the next benchmark is 33% by 2020. And this applies to both big utilities like PG&E and to CCAs. So CCAs also have to meet this renewable portfolio standard. So some basic program features about CCE. So how is it run? What does this mean? So um, although it's not required, all current CCAs that are operating and probably future CCAs are formed by what's called a joint powers authority. And that's basically a bunch of cities or, and or a county coming together and signing a legal kind of structure. And the cities can join into a joint powers authority by passing an ordinance. So they have to usually pass a CCA ordinance and a joint powers of ordinance to join into this CCA. The utility PG&E continues to deliver electricity and meter and bill the customers. An important aspect of this is that CCE by state legislation is an opt-out program. So what does this mean, opt-out? It means that when a CCA starts, all the customers in their service area are automatically enrolled in the program and a customer can choose to opt out and go back to PG&E. So there's a certain amount of time before the program starts to 120 days in which a CCA is required to notify customers in the service area that the program is about to start and give them the option to opt out. But customers can opt back out to PG&E anytime. Conversely, a customer who leaves and goes to PG&E can also choose to go back to the CCE. So there's flexibility. And all customers, whether it's CCE customer or PG&E customer, continue to get a PG&E bill. The only difference is that there's going to be this line item, and this is probably too small for you to see. I actually have an example of this on the table out there, um, if you guys want to look at it after the presentation. It's really interesting to see, but the difference is there will be a different electricity generation charge. This is not an additional charge, it just replaces PG&E's electricity generation charge. So because CCE is a new program, it can be kind of hard to conceptualize what this looks like. So I would like to give some really good examples of current CC 
CCAs or CCEs in operation um, that are very successful. So the first CCE in California was Marin Clean Energy. It started in 2010. It started in the county of Marin in some of the cities, and now it, every city in Marin County is included in it. And they've actually expanded outside the county borders, so it includes unincorporated Napa County, um, the cities of Richmond, Benicia, El Cerrito, and San Pablo. So they're quickly expanding into new territory. They produce, I think right now in the pipeline, they have about 177 additional megawatts of renewable energy projects coming online for their customers, DC customers. Um, oh, they have a 17 member board of directors. So the board of directors is made up of elected officials from each of the cities and counties within their service territory. And this is one of the things that drives the community power aspect of it, is that you can't go and really lobby to a, the head of PG&E. But if your elected official is on the CCE board, you can go and lobby to your elected official to, to, to tell them what kind of renewable energy you want or what kind of programs you want. And so this gives you a little more of a voice in where your electricity or where your electricity is coming from. So this is a really good sh um, chart that kind of shows pricing and the options that Marine Clean Energy offers. So all Marine Clean Energy customers are automatically enrolled in their light green product. And this is 50% renewable energy. And it's RPS compliant, means it meets the state's goals for counting as renewable energy. Customers have the choice to what's called opt up to 100% renewable options. And starting this year, 2015, customers get the very exciting choice to opt up even more to 100% local solar options. So Marine Clean Energy, after a couple of years in development, took those surplus funds and built a local solar project, and customers can purchase energy from there. Or customers can always go back to PG&E. And this is a little outdated. Um, PG&E's, I think, current renewable energy content is 28%. And so you can see that regardless if you're a CCA customer or PG&E customer, you have the same delivery fee. And that's for maintaining the grid and transmission of electricity over the lines. So a lot of people worry, oh, um, you know, if I leave PG&E, a lot of people leave PG&E, who's going to maintain the grid? They're not going to have money for that. PG&E is still getting money for that. Something you may notice is that even though these customers have 50% renewable energy and PG&E customers have 28%, MCE customers are getting significantly cheaper rates on their electricity. So these customers are actually saving money for more renewable energy. The third part of this is something that here is classified as a PG&E fee. It's commonly called an exit fee. And it's mandated by the state, the CPUC. And what that fee is, is something all CCA or CCE customers have to pay. And it's to take the cost of burden for customers leaving PG&E, so that cost isn't placed on PG&E customers. And so PG&E customers can maintain the same rates, but CCE customers have to pay a little more. But even with those exit fees, you can see that MCE customers are still saving money. Are they buying, is PG&E buying from the same source as MCE? They're, they're both, PG&E has a requirement to have so much renewable energy, mm -hmm. and so are they competing with the same I can talk about this a little bit. They're not currently competing because a lot of PG&E's contracts are very old. So a lot of PG&E's current contracts are going to ex um, expire in 2018, about 2020 which is why this is a really good time for CCAs to start. You might see that CCAs are happening all over the Bay Area right now, and it's because they know this is a really good time because they don't want to come online the same time PG&E is going for the same contracts and compete with them. So this is a, the same chart, just for commercial customers. I'm not gonna go into detail, but you'll see that commercial customers get the same offerings as residential customers. And once again, the delivery fee is the same. The generation fee, there's actually even more savings for commercial customers as there is for residential customers. And uh, commercial customers also have to pay that exit fee. But once again, they're saving money even at the 100% renewable option. 
commercial customers are saving money. Assuming they can purchase at a cheaper price over time. Yes. Um, this is just a quick chart. I always add this in presentations, but I thought you guys would be an especially interested group. This is from Maroon Clean Energy, and this is just some of the local power resources that they are purchasing from. So not all of them are ones that they have developed themselves, um, but it's places that they're purchasing. So solar and biogas mainly, and the rest of the renewable energy comes from the Central Valley. Is hydro included in their mix? Do they count that as a renewable? Um, I don't think they're purchasing hydro. I think when they came online, they, I mean, it, it was 2010, so it was like the start of the drought, and I think they kind of foresaw it. But I'm not sure how much of it, if any, is hydro. So the second CCA in California was Sonoma Clean Power. They started serving customers in December of 2000, or May of 2014, but they had a small rollout phase, and then in December, 2014, they expanded greatly to a different customer, a bigger customer base. They have an 11% opt-out rate. So this means within all of Sonoma Clean Power's territory, 11% of their customers choose to go back to PG&E. They have, oh, they, their customers estimated save about six million in their first year. Sonoma Clean Power's structure is the same government structure, is the same as Marin's where they have a board of directors made up of local elected officials. Um, they've done some really cool projects. So they were lucky enough to have its geothermal vent within Sonoma County Cup. And so their 100% renewable um, power is all geothermal within Sonoma. So it's all local, which is really cool. They also did a really interesting project with their local water agency, which was actually the agency that helped start the CCE. And they are putting solar panels on floating docks on some of their holding ponds for the water agency, which I think is really cool. So, is a um, customer that are opting out primarily residential or commercial? That's a good question. I do not know. I can tell you some of the reasons they tell us that they are opting out is um, a lot of people just don't like government being involved. They think government should stay out electricity. Some people, I think, were very confused at the beginning about what CCA was. I think there's more press about it now, but it was a very new program even when Sonoma started. Some people just really like PG&E, mm -hmm. so. So this is very similar to Marin County's chart, so I won't go over it too much detail, but so Marin's basic default option was 50%, Sonoma's is 33%. And then once again, you can opt out to the 100%, which is the 100% local and geothermal. And then once again, the electric generation fee, or sorry, the generation fee is different. The delivery fee is the same. And then there's a PG&E or exit fees that are on the CCA customers. If, if uh, CCs get more and more customer base throughout the state, is, the, is there a possibility of the exit fees, PG&E will be the exit fees are increasing next year, but not because of the additional people joining CCD. It's because of the type of contracts and where the energy market is right now. It's because PG&E is losing money on their large hydro, and so they have to make up that difference. However, these fees will be phased out over time. So the, the concept behind these fees was that PG&E bought all these contracts many years ago, the idea that they're serving X amount of customers. And now these customers are leaving, but they had already purchased, pre-purchased that energy for them. But once those contracts run out, around 2018, 2020, PG&E can no longer say, we're losing money because we already bought you power, because they're already going to know this amount of their customer base, they don't need to buy power for it anymore. So the hope, there is a lot of lobbying to reduce these fees, but eventually it will get fixed. How does this impact the rebates that PG&E offers? Because that's part of the deal. They purchase power ahead of time, and if we use less, they can issue rebates. The net metering, or? Yeah, just rebates on like buying new home appliances, like new air conditioning, new refrigerator. You know, that's part of the services they offer. That's a good question. Customers. I don't know. For energy savings, so I was wondering if the. As far as I know, it, nothing has changed for the pg and customer. I think the CCA customers are probably swallowing that with their exit. Yeah, they would, they would have to pay for on rebates. Yeah. 
for energy efficiency. Oh, are you talking about the CCA customers uh -huh. get rebates? I know, I don't think they have a rebate program, but I know that Marine Clean Energy just rolled out a specialized energy efficiency program for pg and &E customers or Marin Clean Energy customers. And um, not, I'm not sure about the rebates, but general like uh, pg and &E sponsor energy um, programs. Like, I don't know if you guys have heard of Cal like energy, home, home Energy Upgrade, um, which is like a whole Bay Area wide program, but CCNA customers can still enroll in that. So you guys are already getting to all on your slides. You're so good. Um, so this is the same thing, just with commercial cost comparison, 33%, 100%. So, frequently asked questions. See, I told you guys you were getting to it. So, a question we get a lot, will my electricity service be altered? Or a lot of people are concerned that if they're a CC customer and say something happens to their transmission lines that it goes down, that they won't be served or they won't get the same level of service. So the question is no, your electricity service will not be altered or interrupted in any way. Even if something happened to the CC, there are a lot of backstops to make sure that customers can easily just go right back over to PG&E, so that won't be an issue. And PG&E is legally not able to treat CC customers differently than PG&E customers. And so um, we had, an, in San Mateo County last month at our advisory committee meeting on this, we had actually representatives from Sonoma and Marin come down, and they said that their customers have not had any service problems whatsoever, or decrease in service from PG&E, so that's good. Um, so something you guys would be interested in, I have solar panels on my house, what will happen to that? A lot of people are concerned that they'll have to repay whatever fee they have to pay with pg &E, you won't have to repay that. A lot of people are interested in whether that will benefit their solar panels, and the question is yes. Especially now that I heard pg and &E is making solar panels a lot less um, lucrative with some of their new program changes that just came out in the news, but in Marin and Sonoma, they have two programs that really try to drive local and especially residential solar. And one of them is a net metering program, similar to what pg and &E has. So if you are a solar customer and you make more energy than you use, then you get credits back on your energy bill. The difference in Marin and Sonoma is that they're paying a way higher cost back for giving customers way more money. So I think pg and &E pays it at like pays back at a wholesale rate, and Marin and Sonoma are paying back customers at a retail rate, which is significantly higher. And they also have some different program differences. I know there are some issues with pg and &E's credits expiring at the end of the year, or you have to like save it or something. I don't know exactly how it works, but I know Marin and Sonoma, all the credits continually roll over, and I think you can credit it back every single month. So they try to really drive residential solar like that. And they also have a program called Feed and Tariff Program, which is for larger local solar developments. And that's really just to encourage other people to create local renewable energy projects within the CCE's service territory. And there's benefits for that. Um, oh, what about programs for low income in, um, individuals? A lot of people are worried pg and &E has the CARE program and some other things to help low income individuals with their electricity bill. All these programs carry over to the CCA. Why do I still have access to PG&E's energy efficiency programs? Yes. And why is CCE an opt-out program? Why do people choose to opt-out um, CCE's opt-out program? Because that is how it's state-mandated to be. It's in the legislation. Yes. Kristen, who sends out the uh, opt-out notice? PG&E or CCA? The CCA sends it out. However, um, CCA, so pg and CCA when Marin came online, they had a very contentious relationship, and um, pg and &E campaigned a lot against Marin, and then later there was a bill passing that pg and &E can no longer use taxpayer payer funds to campaign against CCE programs. So they kind of have this mouth gap, you can't really talk about it. But since then, I've heard that the relationship has improved greatly, and they kind of describe it as a competitive partnership, because they still have to work together to meter and bill their customers, they put out a lot of information together. So at the beginning of the other year, they actually put out a pamphlet, which I had a pamphlet that has the CCA's rates and PG&E's rates together on one sheet. 
and they also work together and just talking about customer issues. So I think it's really improved over the years. But they are still competitive in that they're competing for who? For the electricity customers. Nice to choice. Yeah, exactly. That's a good choice. Do you, do you expect uh, PG&E to make their available, uh, well, maybe 100% renewable option? Yes, that came out um, last year, right? Over the end of last year, beginning of this year. Do you expect they'll drive to keep I think out so. CCs by bringing that price down? And I think so. Um, as someone who's working to start a CCA, it's definitely not good, right? But when you look at what the overall goal of CCs and CCAs are, is to drive renewable energy development, not just locally, but throughout the state, and it's good. Because in a lot of ways, CCEs are driving to make pg &E better. Because pg &E didn't have competition for so long, so all of a sudden, CCEs come along and like, oh, they have this 100% renewable energy option. Where did that come from? For the uh, transmission lines, I mean, it's electricity, right? It's like the water trying to say, well, I want the environmental water, the clean water versus the dirty water. Yeah. It's all through the same pipes. Yes. How do you control that you're truly getting the electrons that are free? You cannot. <laughs> Okay. You cannot, yeah, let's be very clear about the electricity grid, is that you do, you cannot track electrons. So even if you are purchasing energy from the solar development down your street, once it goes into the grid, it's in the grid. And you're getting whatever energy comes out. So CC, what are the risks and how are they mitigated? I couldn't come here and tell you all the wonderful things about CC because there are like risks that we have to think about when starting such a program. So the biggest risk is rates and market fluctuation. So for everybody, no matter if you're PG&E or CCE, the market is very volatile. And luckily we are very fortunate right now that market prices are at historic low for gas, which also makes renewable energy prices at historical lows. And so CCAs can get these really good energy contracts. But this will probably not always be the same. We don't know what it's going to look like in the future. And that's one of the reasons that why we try to pull Marin and Sonoma up as a good example where they're saving people money. When we're actually starting a CCA program, we try not to overpromise because we can't promise that the rates are always going to be lower than PG&E's. And once again, in 2018, 2020, PG&E will be going out for contracts again, which means their rates could fluctuate a lot. Um, so we don't know what PG&E rates are going to be like either. Some of the ways we try to mitigate this is every time a CCA comes online, they're not required, but they do this anyway, they do something called a technical study. And I'll talk about a little about where all the local CCE programs are and their technical study process, but pretty much everyone is starting to do a technical study right now or about to finish a technical study. And it looks at a lot of things. So one of the things it looks at is what the current price is for energy contracts and tries to um, estimate in the future what future market prices will be and also try to estimate what future PG&E prices will be because you're always comparing yourself against PG&E. And so hopefully that will try to mitigate some of the problems now when we do our rate pricing for the CCE. Um, the second risk is customer opt-out. So if a lot of customers leave the, the CCE program for any reason, Everyone expects to have about a 10 to 15% opt-out rate, which is what Marin and Sonoma pretty much have, and to stay pretty steady, that's totally average. But say 50% of your customers didn't want to be part of your CC, and you don't have enough surplus funds to keep buying energy, then that's a problem. And so one of the ways to try to mitigate that is community engagement and doing it early. So even though a lot of these programs, local programs I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, are still at the exploratory phase, none of them are formed right now, all of them are doing community engagement because they know how it's important to get people educated about this program and get their input about their program very early on. And my county, San Mateo County, is no different. We see this as a really important aspect. A third risk is political. I think this is um, definitely when you're trying to start a CCA program, politics can totally kill it or slow it down and stop it in its tracks, so that's always a concern. But even as the program is running, because the governance board is all elected officials, you never know what's going to happen. And the fourth big one is legislation. 
since CCAs first start coming online and continuing to today, even this year, there's another big bill that could really hurt CCAs. There's constantly legislation being pushed to alter a certain parts of the program or that could really um, threaten parts of the program. Some of the ways we try to mitigate this is just be really involved and have consultants that kind of work with us and keep their ear to the ground and also just have a really strong, I think, statewide CC coalition which I don't think we have right now. So that is something that maybe in the future could be formed so all the CCs can come together and kind of work together against these type of bills. So the fun part of my presentation, now that all the information is over, is like, why, why should you care? Other than the fact that you guys care about the environment and greenhouse gas emissions. But even if you don't, or even if your neighbors don't, or your family doesn't, this is going to affect them. Either you, your local community is probably looking at CCE right now and or is going to form a CCA in the near future. So soon, this is going to affect everybody. So I try to highlight, um, and sorry if I got some of the information from the other CCEs wrong. I actually called some of the people in the last couple days to make sure it's updated, but I'm not so sure on the dates. Um, but I try to highlight the three main CCE efforts that would affect people in this room. So the first one is called Silicon Valley CCU Partnership. And this is a partnership between the cities of Mountain View, Cupertino, Sunnyvale, and unincorporated Santa Clara County. And they're doing something, well, they just did something, what they call their initial feasibility study, where they kind of looked about who would be interested in CCE, the kind of political pushback they might get, some basic questions. This is not the full, the full technical study where they do all the modeling and market analysis. They are, however, deciding, still deciding right now, whether to do a full technical study. And so this is actually a really crucial point, and this is something you want in your community to go to your elected official and tell them, you should at least join the study, at least look to see if it's an option, because the technical study is the first hurdle you need to get to join the JPA. And as you can see, there are a bunch of different interested parties um, that I think will end up joining the technical study if they decide to do one. I think it's looking pretty likely right now. What's the cost of them doing the study? The startup cost for this? So um, it depends on the amount of data because you have to pay for data from PG&E to do it and they get consultants. I believe San Mateo County's was somewhere around somewhere around two hundred thousand dollars, and that was for the county and all twenty cities. So it's not horrible. Well, cheaper than environmental impact. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and it takes fairly fast. I mean, fairly fast. It takes about sixty days to complete once you get the data. For us, actually, the long waiting time was getting the data from PG&E. So PG&E said, and this is not even their fault. Um, PG&E said that for many years they would get one data request a year mm. or a month. And when we asked for their data, they said, well, you have six people ahead of you. Six people. So all of a sudden, so many people care about this that they're getting crazy amount of data requests and they had to hire a bunch of extra people. So that just shows how popular this idea is right now. Um, so uh, Melanie Tover is the member of the city of Sunnyvale. She's been working on this program for a while, so she wanted me to emphasize to you guys that they will be holding community meetings in late September, early October um, about CCE. And I have, in a couple of slides, I'll have the main websites up of all the local CCE programs. So if you're interested, then you should go to that website. And they plan, they plan to form, initially form a GPA in fall 2015 and they hope to start serving customers in quarter four of 2016. So if you live anywhere in this area, by the end of next year, you could be a CC customer. Yeah. What about the city of San Jose? Oh, yes, I forgot to touch on that. So the city of San Jose has a separate group called San Jose Community Power. That's a group of local advocates pushing for it. And I know the city of San Jose is looking at it, However, they're also looking at some less traditional models of um, CCEs, such as going to this company called California Clean Power, which people have mixed feelings about. So they're, I think they're kind of doing their own thing. Um, I, don't quote me on this, I personally think the big thing is that San Jose is just really big and their own kind of separate animal, and everyone else kind of wants 
how to move forward without being dragged by San Jose. <laughs> yes? What, what does the city of Palo Alto have? Because they have something. That the city of Palo Alto basically has their own CC program now. Okay. They're their own electricity provider. Okay. So this would be like that, except just on a bigger scale. Okay. That's actually good for this. Palo Alto and like, um, Sacramento has their own utility. I mean, it's almost like a whole sub. Yeah, they also, they also produce a lot of electricity. Right. Yeah. But do they still use the PGE lines and everything? Um, well, they have to, yeah, yeah, to deliver it. So it's the same model, except they're already doing it. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a similar model. Similar, okay. Yeah. Um, interestingly, a lot of companies, large companies such as Apple and Google, do similar things. They have something called direct access contracts they can do, where they can purchase not all their energy, but a portion of their energy on their own and mm -hmm. choose what type of energy. So, um, for example, Apple, I happen to know, all the direct access contracts they do are all 100% renewable. Um, but there is a state cap on how much a company can purchase of their energy through direct access mm -hmm. as to protect pg and &E. And so there's actually legislation right now, I don't know where it is in the process, but to remove that cap. What is the cap? Is? No, I don't. It's not a very big percent. It's actually, it's um, carved out by the utility service area. And so all every company within PG&E's service territory um, has, all of them together have a cap. And so they each get pieces of that cap distributed among them. So none of them can actually meet all their energy goals with direct access com um, contracts, only a portion of it. No, it's a protective grid. Right? It's a protective grid. So for these huge companies like Google and Apple, I mean, imagine how much energy they must be using. Um, so they don't all leave and PG&E, once again, it's very... The cap goes to 100% that's uh, painful for the CCEs. Right? Yes, it's, very complicated. it's definitely, it's a very complicated thing because one, it would hurt the CCEs, especially in this area where we have a large, a bunch of large energy users, but it also increases the idea of choice because then the companies can choose too. So, um, there's mixed feelings about it. Yes? But couldn't, couldn't the company um, just put solar, I mean, could they generate their own electricity for their own site? Yeah. You know, if they have yeah, yeah, they can do all the on-site renewables they want. That's not included in the cap. Right. This is specific to buying outside and okay. electricity power. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, if you guys are interested in that, look up the legislation um, and the old legislation specifically. I forget what it's called. But my business card's at the front. If you guys want to email me any of the great questions you have that I wasn't able to answer, because then it allows me to do more research. So. How does the PUC inter interact? With Oh, that's a really good question. So the CPU, so when a CCA, okay, go back. The CCE formation process is that the cities form a JPA, and then once the JPA is formed, they send in something to the CPUC called an implementation plan. And that's kind of their business plan and to show the CPUC that we're legit, we know what we're doing, we have all these contracts signed, and the CPUC has to sign off on that before the CCE can start regulating customers. After that, the CPUC only regulates the interaction between PG&E and the CCE. Okay. So at the beginning, there's regulation, and when they interact with PG&E, there's regulation, but not else, else much. So there's no, uh, every three years, there's a cycle of PG&E and the um, CPUC, so the community choice programs never talk to the CPUC. As anymore. far as I know, no. They run as kind of a separate thing. Um, the CPUC does have a site, though, on their page about community choice aggregation. Um, community choice aggregation is what it's called in the legislation. So, like the CPUC or like any official things will say CCA, even though it's a horrible term. Hmm. So, I put this up because the Loma Prieta chapter also includes residents of San, San Benito County. So, Monterey Bay, uh, Monterey Bay Community Power is a partnership between Monterey County, Santa Cruz County, San Benito County, and I believe all the cities within them. Mm -hmm. And they're actually a little ahead of most people in the Bay Area in the CCE formation process. Um, they're funded by the, the Community Foundation Santa Cruz has been helping them get funding and um, funded their technical study. So I believe 
their technical study is either just finished or about to be finished. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can go to their website, and they also have their PDAC, their Project Development Advisory Committee that holds monthly meetings in the Monterey Bay area. So if you're a resident in that area and you want to get involved, going to the PDAC meetings is a really good way to go. Um, you can also just email them or call them to see what their status is. And the one the most true and dear to my heart, Peninsula Clean Energy. So Peninsula Clean Energy is what we dubbed San Mateo County's CC efforts. Currently we're conducting a technical study funded by the county and led by the county, but it also includes all 20 cities within San Mateo County. The results of that study are going to be released on September 1st. We have a um, CCE advisory committee. It's made up of local representatives from each of the 20 cities, two of the board supervisors, and 15 representatives representing a kind of variety of different interests from labor to environmental to social. And the Sierra Club is actually one of our advisory committee um, members. So that's really cool. And we hold our meetings on the fourth Thursday of every month in Belmont. The next meeting, or so the next meeting we'll be talking about um, CCA governance and forming a JPA, but our really big meeting will be at, in the end of September, September 24th. We'll be talking about the results of our technical study. So that will be very exciting. I think it's gonna turn into a three hour meeting, so kind of long. But if you're interested in what's going on in our county, that's the meeting to go to. Um, we do a lot of community engagement. We're also going to be holding community meetings about the technical study for people that can't come to the advisory committee meetings, and those will be at the beginning of October, October 7th. And we hope to have our GPA formed in February of 2016 and start serving customers in fall of 2016. We're very excited. Um, if you want more information, if you want to stay on our mailing list, I brought our mailing list up there. The yellow pamphlets that are up there are also our pamphlets, so feel free to grab them though, because they just have general information about CCEs. And the FAQ sheet is also specific to us, but also has really good information about CCEs in general. And all of this material is also on our website. So, why are all these people in the Bay Area exploring this? I should also mention that Alameda County is about to do a technical study, and Contra Costa is looking at this. And San Francisco has been kind of touch and go with their CCE program, and it started and then stopped and now started again. So everyone in the Bay Area is looking at community choice energy. Why is that? Other than the benefits that we talked about, like I said, this is the time to do it. Historic gas is at an all-time low. Renewable energy is really cheap. We don't have to compete with PG&E for the energy contracts right now. There's a lot of momentum behind this because everybody's talking about it. And there's a lot of affordable financing for renewable energy projects right now. Also, I don't know if this decision has been made, I don't think yet, but at the end of 2016, the solar tax credits are at risk of being totally eliminated, or if not, both probably cut. And so if you want to build solar or contract with solar people, this is the time to do it. So why I'm here is that please, please get involved. As a local official, I can tell you that people, or at least my board, supervisors and elected officials do care when residents show up. They listen to every resident that comes to their advisory committee, every person that emails them about this program. Residents do have a voice. And when we start going to the local cities, or same in the South Bay, when these cities start determining whether or not to join a form a JPA, your guys' voice is going to matter. And like I said, this doesn't just affect you because you're into greenhouse gas emissions, environmentalism, this affects your neighbors and your friends and your family because they might be part of a CCE program. And this is why it's so important to start talking about it now. So the best ways to get involved are contact your local official, join efforts with a local advocacy group. And so we are really lucky in San Mateo County to have a great group of advocates called San Mateo Community Choice. And we have one of our San Mateo Community Choice residents here, and I wanted her to talk a little bit about just what it means to be a CCU advocate and some of the work that they've been doing. Because I really want you guys to hear from someone who's not just a staff member who's working on this, but someone who's personally interested in it. So, uh, Janet, if you want to come up and say a little. She drove here all the way from Millbrae, too. So, right. thank you to Janet. 
So I want to I want to leave this up just for a few minutes in case you guys need to write this down. So these are the three main websites for the three local CC efforts. So Silicon Valley CC Partnership, www.sbccleanenergy.org. They just started their website, so it's a little threadbare right now, but they'll be posting information. And um, Melody from the city of Sunnyvale specifically asked me to point you guys towards that website, so I know they're going to keep it up today. For Peninsula Clean Energy, we have www.peninsulacleanenergy.com. Right now, we're currently developing that website, so it's just a splash page with general information, and over time, it's going to become more robust. Uh, if you want more detailed information, you can go on the Office of Sustainability's website. You can also see all their cool things we're doing at green.sncgov.org. We have all information from every advisory committee meeting we do as far as future meetings as well. But if you want to listen to some of our meeting minutes or meeting audio recordings or look at our meeting minutes or get any of our PowerPoint presentations speakers have done, then I really encourage you to go there. And the Monterey Bay Community Power, MontereyBayCCA.org. And then contact information for staff, local staff or elected officials that are working on this are on all three of those pages. And then also put up San Mateo Community Choices um, website and Carver Free Mountain Views website. San Mateo Community Choice, you guys are meeting bi-monthly still, correct? What? You guys are meeting bi-monthly for like yes. two times a month? Uh, first and third Tuesday. And I think Harvey Free Mountain View meets monthly. I could be wrong about that. And what's uh, Melody's uh, last name? Melody Tober, T O V A R. She works for the city of Sunnyvale. Um, also, you can contact Demetra McBride, is the director of the Office of Sustainability for the County of Santa Clara. And she would also know about the program. So, who's taking the lead on that? Is it the county? I don't no, I don't think it's the county. Okay. So for a while, it was actually only Cupertino Mountain View and Sunnyvale, and Sunnyvale had been working on it a long time, but kind of had a hard time like hurting the cats, so to speak. Yeah. And the county was always kind of like on the edge, and it wasn't until recently that I was even informed that they had decided to commit to the pre-feasibility study. So I have a feeling that they're not, um, they're not heading that effort. But they did submit, I think, some money to do the pre. Study. So, have a little bit of one. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, just a dumb question. So, I'm assuming this whole effort is going because PG is moving too slowly toward clean energy. Yes. Basically, that's you know. So, in 2018, 2020, when their contracts go out, if they want to compete, they're going to have to mm -hmm. bring the same amount. Yeah, they're going to have to be either really cheap or really sustainable or both. Okay, at that point, would would it be in their best interest to drive the community choice energy out of business? Yeah, I mean, it depends. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always, yeah, they probably want to keep their profits, right? And so they'll right. probably do whatever it takes to try to drive the CC out of business. And that's one of the risks is that you're always competing with pg and &E, which is held in the community for a long time, a really big enterprise, so. So they could compete and potentially, you know, price the locals out of, out of the country. Unless the CPUC steps in. Yeah. Christian, may I add? Yes. May I ask yeah, of course, yes. Um, if you're only interested in receiving electricity, then that scenario is absolutely possible. But don't forget that the CCAs are reinvesting their um, funds in the community. Yeah. So you're also yeah. getting the community benefits as well as the electricity. Yeah, we hope by that time that the CCAs will be a more familiar model, it'll be more well steeped. Um, some of the problem is that people want immediate gratification, they want to see the community benefits right away, and it takes a few years for the CCAs to get enough surplus funds to do that. But we are seeing that in Marin and Sonoma, and Marin's only been started, um, been operation for five years. So it's a pretty good rate of return, I think, as far as the community aspect of it. What's their operating costs? Because there's overhead, right? There's people like that, that have to negotiate. Contracts. I don't know what their total operating costs are, but they do have like transparent financial statements on their website. So if you go on their website, which is on the next slide, then you can look at that. They do run with a pretty small staff. Um, they have like a director and then a couple of 
helpful in like purchasing team people and having six other staff members. So I think they don't have more than 15 people. Hmm. Um, so other resources, Marine Clean Energy, Sonoma Clean Powers, Land Catcher Choice Energy, that's the one in Lancaster. And the Lean Energy US is, um, well someone we actually, they work for us as consultants, but it's a company founded by Sean Marshall, who was elected official in Marin when the Marin County CC started and she got really involved in it and she actually saw the, the CC formation process through the end and decided that she was so into it that she was going to start her own company. Um, but it's also a really good just general resource about CCs, not just in our area but throughout the state. So if you want to be really tied into what's going on the statewide level or even nationwide level, that's a really good resource to go to. I just really appreciate your guys' time. There's a lot of momentum behind these programs, and this is a really great time to do something like this. And I think now is the time for us to take our energy in our own hands and make a difference. Because we can all put solar power nails up and do small things, but this is a way to make a big difference in our communities. So I hope you guys are really excited about this, and feel free to contact me anytime if you have questions. This is my contact information. It's also on every piece of information that we publish about CCEs, so I'm pretty accessible. So, I appreciate your guys' time. Thank you. Something that you guys have surprised me and asked about is like the renewable energy credits. 
um, thing. So the, the reason that Marin has 50% and Sonoma has 33% default is because Marin has a lot more renewable energy credits and they're 50%. And they got a lot of flack for that. And so when Sonoma came online, they decided to use less renewable energy credits. And so that's where theirs is 33%. Because it's cheaper to buy renewable energy credits than it is to buy the, the bundle together. Are you paying some else for the green yeah. yeah, it's a very contentious well, issue. Yeah. And then uh, the California utilities have to be 33% by 2020, was it? Or? Yeah, 33% by 2020. Yeah. Great. Yes. Are you willing to take your presentation on the road? You know, <laughs> I, you know, I know I have some other groups that might actually fill the room a little better than, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, here, but, uh, I do this a lot in San Mateo County, but I'm definitely willing to give you my presentation, and if you have some key dates, I can try to plan ahead. Um, but I also would talk to the Carbon Free Mountain Group. group. Maybe we can pair together, or they can do some presentations. So it would probably be even better to hear from local people about this. Um, I asked the head of their organization to come, but he already has something going on tonight. But, but yeah, definitely. I can take the show on the road. <laughs> yeah, Melody Hillbart is a great Yeah, Melody in Sunnyville is a really good one. So there's a lot of local resources too that I can help you guys up with. Let's get you to Rotary and Lions and... I am doing that all yeah. over.